All right, listen up everyone, because class is in session. I've got an important video for you today. This, as you might recognize, is the FLIR 1. I picked this up at CES, and this allows me to do something that my eyes cannot, and this is C heat. Seeing heat is a huge deal because believe it or not, when it comes to the temperatures inside of your system, some things are happening that you may not realize, which is why today's video is extremely important. We are going to check a couple of different things today. We're going to look at an air-cooled system like the one you see behind me, and we're going to be taking a look at a water-cooled system to see what some of the differences are in the way heat behaves both in air-cooled and water-cooled environments. This should be good. This is my 7700K system that I built. Take a look at it with the naked eye right here. You can see other than some LEDs on the motherboard, you can't really tell that it's turned on. But the moment we put infrared in front of it, you can see there's actually quite a bit of heat already on the motherboard just from simply being powered on. I mean, look at that. That in itself should be pretty eye-opening on what's going on with your system when it's plugged in and not even doing anything. But what about when you turn it on and there's no load on the system? Let's do a little time-lapse to see what happens. It's pretty interesting how the VRMs are already pretty warm, even though the system is sitting here idle. It's not under any sort of load. And you can see the chipset there is looking pretty warm as well on its heat spreader. Something else putting off a little bit of heat here that you can see is the actual built-in sound card. So that's kind of interesting. Now I just loaded up an overclock profile here at five gigahertz on the 7700K. And as you can see, immediately the upper VRM heatsink started to get kind of, well, you can see the temperatures are changing there. It went from kind of a yellow to an orange immediately during booting. What I'm going to do next here is I'm going to do an A to 64 stress test on the CPU and the memory. So keep an eye on the memory going up and down right here. I don't know how much that's going to actually increase on temperatures, but the bright red area right there is VRM and the top right there is also VRM and this is chipset. So keep an eye on this area. These are the tubes right here for the H100 that's keeping the system cool. And let's see what happens over time when uh, we put this thing under a little bit of load. You can see the tubes have warmed up a little bit. The VRMs are pretty damn smoking and uh, the chipset didn't change too, too much. But yeah, you can see right there though that we've got some pretty intense loads that take place on the CPU, especially when they're overclocked. And like right now, overclocked to five gigahertz at 1.4 volts. Yeah, in fact, this H100 can't even really keep this uh, cooled like it needs to. So I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the test before I, before I blow it up. Okay, so next up is graphics cards. Side note. My skin is actually cooler than the temperature of the chipset. There you go. So that's why my hand looks all yellow and not red. Anyway, we're gonna go and do graphics card testing here. One of the things I wanna check for here on this test is I wanna see what's actually happening with the heat pipes. The heat pipe design is what so many of these companies actually tout as being, you know, what makes them so good. So I figure let's check, let's test that. Let's just let it uh, time lapse once again and see what happens over time with an MSI 1080 Gaming X all factory fan control but it is overclocked to 2050 and the voltage is at 100%. So let's see what happens. Interestingly enough, the pipes are pretty dang hot when I touch them, but they are still cooler than the PCB is, which is why they look cool on camera, but the PCB is the hottest point. Remember, this is showing us a range of temperature, not a color as a representation of temperature. So red does not necessarily mean red hot, it just means that's the hottest thing on the image. This could be negative 20 degrees Celsius and still be red if we were comparing it to something that was negative 50 degrees Celsius, if that makes sense. Now back plates are one of those things that's always been a question. Is it actually doing any good or is it causing harm? Some people believe back plates cause an insulation issue where heat can get trapped between the back of the graphics card PCB and the back plate causing more damage than good. 
Now we'll need more testing in the future to determine if that's true and there's a lot of variables and a lot of different backplate designs so there's no way to really give you a definitive answer on that one. But what I want you to take a look at here is a couple of things. I want you to see the way the heat kind of spreads across the backplate as the graphics card gets hotter. And I also want you to pay attention to what's going on on the motherboard and around the graphics card. I want you to see how the graphics card is actually affecting the temperatures of things next to it. That's the whole point of this. Also too, is I do have the span currently locked so that it's not going to allow the range of temperature to change as the graphics card's getting hotter, since that's what I have it pointing at right now. I want you to see the graphics card temperatures change uh, in relation to the environment you know, around it as a whole. And you're gonna see it probably jump twice, maybe once or twice on the temperature range, where once the graphics card turns white, it resets and then it starts to turn white again. So that's why you're gonna see that. All right, enough talking, let's go ahead and get the test going. Look at that, look how hot that is. The actual backplate is about as hot as the VRMs up there. So that's why further testing on backplate designs is gonna be a big deal for a lot of manufacturers to make sure they're doing it right. And you can see it just reset range again because it couldn't go any warmer than white. So you can see we are now at 55C on the backplate where it's touching right there. And it's actually now hotter than the VRM. Do you see how there's more white here on the graphics card than there is on the VRMs right up there? Yep, the graphics card is now warmer than the surface temperatures of the VRM. Pretty amazing. But check this out. Do you see how much heat is actually affecting the motherboard? Do you see how those three dots right there above the graphics card are just as warm as, well, some of the parts of the PCB here on the graphics card? Well, that's where your M.2 would be. That's why case flow and airflow is hugely important when it comes to your case. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second, but yeah, your graphics card, especially air-cooled cards, blowing down on the motherboard are creating an issue where it is warming up parts around it. Well, I wouldn't really call it an issue, but it's something definitely to keep in mind and why M.2 placement is huge when it comes to motherboards. It's also why putting them on the back of the motherboard tray sandwiched between a back panel with zero airflow, it's not necessarily a good idea. So what about water cooling builds? Obviously that's gonna be better. Well guys, what we're looking at here is my water cooled ITX build I did for Fractal. This is the Define Nano S. It is a single loop incorporating both a GTX 970 from Gigabyte, this is the G1 Gaming, and of course a 4790K i7 and an ITX uh, EVGA Stinger motherboard. So the hotter part on the screen here that you can see is the chipset that is not water cooled. The, you can kind of see the outline of the block right there. That is where the water block is for the CPU. And of course the graphics card is facing towards us. So what we're really looking for here is I wanna see what happens to the loop temperature as the temperature inside the system starts to go up. So we're gonna, that's what we're gonna kind of look for here. I'm gonna start a heaven benchmark and we're gonna see just what happens as we let it go. I'm curious as to what the loop temp is gonna look like. This loop is with glass tubing, which is also an insulator. Glass is an insulator. So we wanna see here what, uh, I don't know, I'm curious as to how that's gonna work out. So let's just shut up and do it. Well, temperatures are pretty much equalized. I wanna point some things out here. You can see the loop started to glow because obviously it's getting warmer. Uh, you can see the chipset's pretty darn warm and the VRM started to warm up. One thing I wanna point out here real quick though is you can see the warmth of the fluid right here in the glass. What looks like right here, the fluid leaving the graphics card being super hot is actually not. What you're seeing right there is a bleed effect of the heat of the motherboard behind the tube actually glowing through the tube, which is why up here, it's not nearly, as you can see, right? It, stop that. It makes this bend right here. It doesn't cool off as it goes through the bend. It's just less heat glowing through. But look at how hot the motherboard is. The mother, look how hot that motherboard actually got, even on a water-cooled system right here. Part of the reason for that right now is I have the side panel off the case, so there's very little directional airflow. You can see the RAM actually started to get pretty warm too. So that's an eye-opener. Let's talk about this. Guys, this is important. 
Okay, class, what did we learn today? Well, although it's important to keep things like your CPU and your GPU as cool as possible, things like CPU blocks, GPU blocks, big ass Noctua air coolers and such, keep in mind that there is a, an, an entire system that is going on inside of your case. That's the reason why we put our stuff in cases is it gives us an enclosure to control the environment for cooling. The problem is some folks believe that because they have a CPU block and a GPU block that they can run an external remote radiator somewhere else through tubing and not have to run any fans in their system giving them a nearly 100% silent system. The problem with that is as you've seen with your very own eyes today, there are still parts in your system putting off heat that have to be cooled. Your RAM, your VRMs, your heat sinks that are on your motherboard doing different things like your chipset, uh, all of those things have to be cooled. Now I had already seen this sort of stuff before. I mean, I've got a laser temp probe right here. I've used laser temp probes all the time, but I've never had a chance to see how the heat of certain components affect things around it. This is my first time spending any time with thermal imaging and it really was an eye opener and it's gonna change the way I build my systems moving forward. So I hope this has also shed some light for you guys on what to think about when you're putting together your systems, what types of fans you use and where you place them. There's actually some system integrators that actually do this with all of their system designs, Puget System being one of them. They actually use thermal imaging to design their systems and that is huge. That's why you're gonna be seeing this now used in any graphics card, CPU testing, cooler testing in the future. Anyway guys, that's all for today. I, I'm actually kind of sweating right now because I've been doing all this thermal testing in here and it's hot and I'm fat and so anyway. Yeah, I'm gonna go now before I start dripping sweat all over the place. Uh, let me know what you guys thought about today's video. If you have any ideas you think I should use this thermal imaging gun on, or this thermal imaging camera on, let me know. Keep it clean. Let's keep it PC related only. Ish. Whatever. Experiments are bound to happen. Time to go, guys. Thanks for watching, and as always, I'll see you in the next one.